Ladies and gentlemen, good evening. Thank you very much for coming. Um, anyone who has been at Hay on Wai over the last 10 years will know that this is about as close and as good as it gets for me. Um, you can fool the Grand Committee, you can bid for sainthood, but you fuck with a hitch at your peril. <laughs> Please welcome Christopher Hitchens. So um, it's a fairly slow day at the shrink, and uh, this guy comes in, hasn't made an appointment, he's shown in, and he, he just stands there in front of the shrink's desk going, <laughs> panting like that. And the shrink says, um, can I help you? Choosing his words with care. The guy just stands there going, <laughs> like that, panting. The shrink thinks, give it, give it time. Ask again if you can be of assistance. And like, <laughs> shaking and panting. They do it a few more times, and finally the guy says, <laughs> I'm just a dog, that's all I am. Nothing but a dog is all. And the shrink says, well, you want to get on the couch? The guy says, I'm not allowed on the fucking couch. <laughs> oh, you like that? Okay, well... I just want to see how easily pleased you were. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for coming to my more downsized cabaret and team uh, venue. I had been hoping to pull the Van Morrison crowd, but this is probably more choosy. Um, Peter may have told you that what I really live for now is stand-up and also karaoke. <laughs> we don't have a karaoke machine here. You'll be, you'll be sorry to find out. I did karaoke in North Korea. There's only one club in North Korea. So he just opened and I, I was one of the opening headliners at Pyongyang Karaoke Club. A stone-faced, Aztec-faced audience of paid members of the Korean Workers' Party. So I'm not shy in front of this audience at all. You can't bomb like you can bomb in Pyongyang. And I did, um, I gave them, um, Proud Mary, and uh, girls just want to have fun. <laughs> I don't want you to think I can't sing uh, without a karaoke machine. I can do. Left a good job in the city, working for the man every night and day. But you would be better with music, <laughs> I know. And this, the theme of this evening is somewhat melancholy. I can sing... An old dirge from Dublin, which goes, you may know it. Um, it was early last September, as near as I remember. I was walking down the street in drunken pride. When I fell into the gutter, thinking thoughts I dared not utter. And a pig came up and lay down by me side. As I lay there in that gutter, thinking thoughts I dared not utter. A fair young maid came by and she did say, You can tell a man who boozes by the company he chooses. And at that the pig got up and walked away. <laughs> and the pig got up and slowly walked away. Now, the, that was the karaoke bit. But I, the stand-up story is, in a way, sadder still, I was a finalist in the Washington Celebrity comedy improv a couple of years ago and I was beaten and I would say beaten badly and unfairly by um, Senator Joseph Lieberman <laughs> then later to become one of the most disastrous vice presidential candidates in American history and he openly cheated, he used cue cards prepared for him by his staff and the fix was in from the start because they were hoping obviously for someone famous to win so they get publicity for their ghastly charity that we were doing it for and, but I realized, though, that even with cue cards, and even though he looks like uh, a leprechaun, <laughs> Senator Liebman could have in him the makings of, a, of what we call in the United States a Catskill comedian. Perhaps some of you know what I mean, the, the Catskills with old Jewish retirement homes where ham comics, I suppose they don't call themselves ham comics, um, 
go and do their stuff. If you've seen Dirty Dancing, you know the sort of scene. The guy, guy comes on, he says, uh, so I, I finally found a, a girl who's just like my mother. Looks like her, sounds like her, acts like her, even dresses like her. So I take her home. My father doesn't like her. <laughs> That's cat skill comedy. You can do it in your sleep. Um, I personally am of the opinion that a joke is not a joke unless it is very piercingly at somebody's expense. <laughs> the uses of humiliation should not be neglected. Taste is not really a consideration. Um, there's a guy on the Los Angeles freeway trying to get home. He's stuck in the most appalling traffic on the freeway. But he has a car phone. Dials his number while still driving. Ring, ring. Phone answers. See? Si. He says, Teresa. It's the, it's the Spanish maid. See, si. si, senor. Uh, can you get my wife on the line? Quick. I'm in a hurry. See, si, senor. Trots away. Comes back. Uh, wife in, in bedroom, senor. So, well, get her out of there. I need her in a hurry. She comes back after a bit more trotting in and out. Says, wife in bedroom with other, other hombre, senor. Says, what? Where are you? You in the den? See? Si. Okay, you by my desk? See? Si. Pull open the left-hand drawer. Is there a gun in there? See? Si, senor. Okay. Do this. Take the gun. Go upstairs. Shoot her. Shoot him. Get on the bedroom extension. Long wait. Finally, the extension. he's still fighting the most appalling traffic. With him. And trying to hold the phone. Long wait. She comes uh, to, on, the, on the line. The extension's picked up. Teresa, si, senor. Have you done it? Si. Are they both dead? Si, senor. Headshots. Si. Okay. Now I want you open the window and throw them both out into the swimming pool. No, no swimming pool here, senor. Is this two, one, three, five? Nine? It's got to be at somebody's expense. I'm just giving you my sort of ABC of how to do this kind of thing, if you were ever stuck for a routine. Um, well then, uh, there are these two onions. Male onion, female onion. Rolling along together, pop, bang into each other. Instant rapport. A torrential affair begins. They can't get enough of each other. Pretty soon, an onion bonding has occurred. Not long enough, I think, to, make, to tie the knot. Get together, make it legal. And their union is blessed, you'll be glad to hear. I, uh, and a little baby onion, a tiny little cocktail onion is born. <laughs> and um, this means, of course, the, the father onion has to put in more time at the shipyard, extra shifts, you know what it's like. Mother onion, much encumbered with other work around the place, and this and that, and the baby onion isn't as well, well supervised as he might have been, and uh, as baby onions will, the door being left open one day, rolls out, across the sidewalk, right into the path of a sodding great lorry, flattened out, rushed to hospital, a team of surgeons fights all night to save his life, Mother Onion, out of it, heavily sedated, <laughs> no more, can't, just can't, you know, can't, can't take it, gone. Father Onion rolling up and down the corridor outside. <laughs> the emergency room going like this, wearing a little groove in the ghastly hospital carpet. Towards dawn, the flap doors open and the surgeon comes out pulling the mask from his head and dashing the perspiration from his eyes and says uh, to the father onion who rolls up anxiously and says well what tell me is he will he is he what he says, no it's, he'll live but I'm afraid he's going to be a vegetable for the rest of his life <laughs> neither clean <clears throat> neither completely clean nor filthy nor you'll be noticing I hope uh, nor short, nor brief. <laughs> the doctor, look, the doctor calls the guy at work. This has never happened before. And says, can you come and see me on the way home? It's really important. 
can you stop by? And the guy says, yeah, why, why is it? I can't tell you, I cannot tell you on the telephone. So the guy stops by his doctor's office on the way back uh, home and the doctor says, look, I don't know how to tell you this. And it, well, it should never have happened at my office. Okay, uh, sit down, sit down. Um, it's about your wife, it's not you, don't worry. Rather callously, I think. Um, <laughs> man by now is slightly on the edge of his chair and says, well, it's the tests. We, we, you know, she was by recently. We took some tests. We sent the samples off. And this really shouldn't, he goes on about it. Shouldn't happen in my office. Can't happen. But the samples got mixed up and they've come back and it's terrible. I mean, we don't know which one is the right one. And, but I can narrow it down for you. The guy says, well, so what, what, is the, what is the bottom line here? The doctor says, well, she's either got AIDS or she's got Alzheimer's. I don't know which it is. And he says, do you have any suggestions, doctor? And the doctor says, yeah, I do actually have a suggestion. That's why I wanted you to come by on your way home. When you get home, suggest a drive to the old girl. If she says yes, get her in the car, drive as far out of the city as you can, and then park the car, and then suggest a stroll, like in the old days, and walk her as far as you can away from that car. And when you've got her as far as you can away from it, run and jump back in the car and speed away and leave her there. And if she finds her own way home, never fuck her again. <laughs> I told you, taste is not a factor. You have to keep... It has to be at somebody's expense. But if you... Now, suppose you're doing a nicer audience than apparently you are. A sort of more tender... You can always try... A little recitation. People don't teach poetry anymore. You notice this? No one's taught to memorize anything. If you can recite even a little, you can, you can impress people. You can stir them. You can move them. Do you know the story? It's an Aesop story of the, the fox and the raven. The, the bird, the raven has the cheese and the fox wants it. How does the fox get the raven to give up the cheese? You know the Aesop story. Well, the fox flatters the raven and um, this isn't a joke flatters the raven into thinking that it could sing, that it's a great singer, and it opens its beak and the cheese falls to the fox. It's an old Aesop story. Done into a beautiful uh, piece of doggerel by an unknown American poet. I wish I knew who this was. It appears in the very few anthologies that I have as written by Anonymous. It's called The Sycophantic Fox and the Gullible Raven. And it goes like this. That, um, a raven sat upon a tree, and not a word he spoke, for his beak contained a piece of brie, or maybe it was work for. We'll make it any kind you please. Uh, at all events, it was a cheese. Beneath the tree's umbrageous limb, a hungry fox sat, smiling. He saw the raven watching him and spoke in tones beguiling. J'admire, quoth he, ton beau plumage. The which was simply persiflage. Two things there are, no doubt you know, to which a fox is used. A rooster that is bound to crow. A crow that's bound to roost. And whichsoever he espies, he tells the most unblushing lies. Sweet fowl, he said. I hear you're more than merely natty. Indeed, I hear you sing to beat the band and Adelina Patty. Pray render with your golden tongue a bit from Goethe Dameron. This subtle speech was aimed to please the bird, and it succeeded. He thought no crow in all the trees could sing as well as he did. In flattery, completely doused, he gave the jewel song from Faust. But gravitation's law, of course, as Isaac Newton showed it, exerted on the cheese its force, and elsewhere soon bestowed it. In fact, there is no need to tell what happened when to earth it fell. I blush to add that when the bird took in the situation, he uttered one emphatic word, unfit for publication. <laughs> the fox was greatly startled, but he merely sighed and answered, tut. The moral is, a fox is bound to be a shameless sinner. And also, when the cheese comes round, you know it's after dinner. But what is only known to few, the fox is after dinner too. 
Now, you can charm, as I say, less or more civilized audience than yourself with stuff like that, but what they want, they like a bit of poetry and a bit of ballading. What they want is filth, you'll find. <laughs> and here I think that the limerick form is probably the handiest. It's the, the most easy and pungent delivery system for the smut that your customers really want. And there's a story within a story about the usefulness of a limerick and also how it can go wrong. And remember, I'm telling you, this is boot camp for, for a stand-up. There's a boring guy who knows he's boring, and he, it's come round to his turn to give the toast at the annual dinner of his ghastly professional association, whatever it is. And he knows how to say a few remarks and to thank last year's retiring chairman and all this kind of thing. He feels he needs a bit of zip and brio and espiglerie, as um, Bertie Worcester used to call it. So he stops in his club on the way, and he says to a friend, a rather gamey friend at the bar, you wouldn't have such a thing as a kind of joke about your person, would you, that I could use to amuse the customers? And the guy said, well, I've got a reasonably filthy limerick for you. Quite easy to remember. The guy says, all right, I'll buy it. And the guy says, okay. It goes like this. There was a young fellow named Skinner who took a young girl out to dinner. Dinner went fine. By half past nine, it was dinner, not Skinner, the dinner. They repeated it, got it more or less by heart, thought it was the kind of thing that would please his clientele, and was muttering it to himself all through the dinner, knowing it was his turn soon, wondering if he'd got it right. It came his turn to speak, said, heard rather a good joke uh, on the way here, picked it up at the club, as a matter of fact, conscious of a slight unease. He said, um, there was a young fellow named Tupper, Rallying, says, who, who took a young girl out to supper? He's got it, he's back, he's back on form. <laughs> so, he said, the supper went fine, and by half past nine, he was upper, not tupper, some other fucking fellow called Skinner. <laughs> this is where you can make your bloomer, ladies and gentlemen. I just sit alone. I just sit alone making, making pathetic word games for myself. I look out of the window, I look down again at the console. I just do sad, lonely word games. Trivial. <laughs> pathetic, really. Um, the one I'm working on now is one where you just take any well-known phrase or saying which has the word heart in it. Replace it with the word dick. It cheers me up, sometimes. <laughs> for example, bury my bury my dick at wounded knee. <laughs> I left my dick in San Francisco. <laughs> dick break hotel. <laughs> the dick is a lonely hunter. <laughs> the dick has its reasons. <laughs> it, it can really, you know, a whole day uh, <laughs> go by. And so, but wait, I'll tell you what the payoff is. The payoff is that every time you hear someone refer to the heartland, a sort of wintry smile can creep across your face. I'm going back to the I'm going back to the heartland. Yeah, I heard that. Yeah. I heard that. The um, there are various forms of sanity that the limerick can take. The best ones, I think, are episcopal or liturgical, as in. Um, uh, a vice both obscene and unsavory holds the Bishop of Barking in slavery with lascivious howls. He deflowers young owls that he lures to an underground aviary. <laughs> or there was a young lady of Kew who remarked as the curate withdrew, the vicar is quicker and slicker and thicker and longer and stronger than you. There are less hardcore ones, like the, the um, Lady of Chichester, whose tits made the saints in their niches. To, uh, one morning at Matins, her breast in white satins made the bitch of Chichester's britches. To, uh. And then there's, there's the more raw stuff, like um, uh, the Bishop of Central Japan 
used to roger himself with a fan. And when taxed with these acts, he replied, it contracts and expands so much more than a man. (laughs) Or um, the Anglican Dean of Hong Kong, the Anglican Dean of Hong Kong had a thing that was nine inches long and he thought that the waiters were admiring his gaiters when he went to the loo. He was wrong. That, I'm glad you noticed, that's, that's by W.H. Auden, who did a wonderful, of, the, of whom there exists a marvellous collection of un, unpublished, mainly gay, uh, filth. No cue cards, right? nothing. Um, just a second here. Um, so you wouldn't believe how dry it is backstage. So... And I, I dare say you know what the Buddhist says to the hot dog vendor. You don't? He says, make me one with everything. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, that's, wait, wait, that's only part one, because the Buddhist then hands over a $50 bill and waits while he munches, and the, nothing happens. And he says to the hot dog vendor, okay, well, what about my change? And the hot dog vendor says, change comes only from within. <laughs> <laughs> I myself have never heard anything more profound than that. And then there's uh, clean ones. Um, when Gauguin was visiting Fiji, he observed things are different here, e.g. <laughs> While Tahitian skin calls for tan spread on thin, you can splosh it on here with a squeegee. That's clean, I think you'll agree. A uh, young engine driver called Hunt <laughs> was given an engine to shunt, saw a runaway truck by yelling out, duck, saved the life of the fellow in front. <laughs> That's clean too. As opposed to say, uh, <laughs> I was told by an oil man who, who'd known her of a girl from Red Gulch, Arizona, the inside of whose twat was so scorchingly hot that it lit his Corona Corona. <laughs> That's a dirty one. The, the great genius of, of this genre, now that Kingsley Amis and Philip Larkin have passed on and no longer exchange them and refine and polish and, and lovingly um, make them fouler and nastier and meaner, is uh, Robert Conquest, who has, um, I'm, I have the honor to say I'm uh, his friend. He keeps the the limerick form well burnished and can do it in any number of ways as dirty as you like, as clean as you like or as literary as you like and I thought I'd um, share with you uh, those of you who know as you like it will remember the uh, seven ages of man speech and the, the evolutions that the man performs from being a baby mewling and puking in his mother's arms to the lover sighing like furnace to the soldier seeking the bubble's reputation even in the cannon's mouth, you, you know it, right? It's quite a long and intricate speech. It can be done in limerick form like this in the seven ages. Uh, first you have puking and mewling, then very pissed off with your schooling, then fucks and then fights and then judging chaps' rights, then sitting in slippers, then drooling. <laughs> that was a a moment's work for, for Congress. And I, but I thought I wanted to end on a more elevated note because I think in the spirit of give and take that is hay in the democratic atmosphere, I want to be at your mercy. I want to be anybody's. I want to be yours very soon. Um, but I want, to, I want to end on a suitably melancholy note and say you can ask me anything you like, anything you want at all, and I promise that my answer will be completely truthful. It's a dare. Um, but the the elevated Shakespearean note on which I wish to end was this um, is is with my favourite sonnet, um, and I'll tell you why it's favourite in a second. Uh, you may you may know the one I mean. It's um, when in disgrace with them um, with fortune in men's eyes, I all alone beweep my outcast state and trouble deaf heaven with my bootless cries and look upon myself and curse my fate, wishing me like to one more rich in hope, featured like him, like him with friends possessed, desiring this man's art and that man's scope, with what I most enjoy contented least, when in this state, 
myself almost despising, haply, I think, on thee, and then my soul. Like lark at break of day arising, quits sullen earth and sings at heaven's gate, for thy sweet love remembered. Such wealth brings that then I scorn to change my state with kings. And I like this sonnet above rubies, not because of the wonderful play on state and king and the political and social subtext, as we've learned to call it, but because of the earlier bit. Marvellous, though, that subtext is, the where, where he's saying, desiring this man's art and that man's scope, wishing me like to one more rich in hope, featured like him, like him with friends possessed. What do we learn from this? There was somebody, there was some guy, who Shakespeare envied. He thought, I wish I had this man's talent. I wish I was as good as him. I wish I was as smart. I wish I had his wit. I wish I had his gift. I can't rest until I know who that guy was. I want very, very, very badly to know. Until I know, I can know no rest. Which is why, filthy and disgusting though it is, my stand-up routine will always have this dying fall. And so does the karaoke, uh, as you will, will one day find out. So I'm at your mercy now, ladies and gentlemen. It was very nice of you to come. You can ask me anything you want. I'm anybody's. I'm yours. Thank you. Maybe I shouldn't point in case you think I've filled the place with a clack of sycophantic, toadying friends who will <laughs> ask me soft questions. Ma'am. Can you give it some Wellington boot? <laughs> Bring it up a bit. Can't hear a blind word you're saying. <laughs> She's shy. Very good. Um, I've just been in your other um, performance tonight, which I actually took very seriously because for the first time. Uh, because for the first time in a long time, I heard somebody from the left exposing something practical and useful. And then I see you here in another role um, playing the clown. So, exactly where do you stand? <laughs> <clears throat> the reason I like um, P.G. Woodhouse and Oscar Wilde is because they teach you to, te to take um, frivolous things seriously. And, well, and serious things frivolously. I'm sorry, I, I was, you were waiting for the other shoe to drop. Um, uh, it's all a complete farce, you understand. We're born into a losing struggle. I... I've been into this minutely. I've investigated the road up ahead. No one comes out of this a winner. <laughs> In the meantime, I think one must show some contempt and some defiance. And the best means of, of doing that that I know are irony and obscenity. Hello. Hello yourself. It's all absurd, and, but you're an admirer of Woodhouse, but Woodhouse is quite literary. Is there any, any other absurdities you get off on, like um, Stephen, Leacock, Edward, Lear, Lewis, Carroll? Is there absurdity there that you find useful as well? If you challenged me to do Jabberwocky, I could do it. Do you want me to do it? Yeah. But I don't like the Reverend Dodgson otherwise, and I think... Uh, Edward Lear is a complete and utter pain in the ass and, and has ruined the limerick form for all time by neglecting the beauty of its, of its punchline. Um, you, want, you want Jabberwocky? You are easily pleased. Uh, oh, fuck. Um, uh, Twas brilling and the slithy toves to Garen Gimble in the wave, or Mimsy with Borogoves and the Moam Raths our grave. Some people really get off on this. Um, let me see. Beware the Jabberwock, my son. The jaws that bite, the teeth that catch. Beware the Jabberwock -jab bird and shun the frumious bandersnatch. 
He took his vorpal sword in hand. Long time the magsome foe he sought. Then rested he by a something fucking yum yum tree. <laughs> and stood a while and thought, and as in uffish thought he stood, the jabberwock with eyes aflame came whiffling through the talgy wood and, and burbled as it came. One, two, one, two, and through and through, the vorpal blade went snicker-snack. He left it dead, and with his head, with its head, he went galumphing back. And hast thou slain the jabberwock? Come to my arms, my beamish boy. O frabjous day, kalukale, he chortled in his joy. T'was brilliant, the slithy toes did gyre and gimble in the wave, all mimsy were the borogoves and the mome wraths out grave. Easily pleased. The Reverend, I'm more interested in the, in the pederastic side of the Reverend Dodgson, to be absolutely honest with you. What you want is to run into a filthy schoolgirl with a dire shortage of pocket money. And that's what he thought uh, Victorian values were. Um, I, I'd like to say that you are the highlight of Hay for me every year, and I think your mind is absolutely incredible, and you're a joy to listen to. Um, Hi, but I would like to. <laughs> but I would like to know. Um, no, you can't buy me a drink. There are two of you. <laughs> um, I would like That's to off. <laughs> I would like to know if there's anything about which you don't have an opinion, and also, if you can't answer that question, what is your favourite P.G. Woodhouse line? Ah. Probably the best, I'll get to this, uh, if you, I'll save up your first question for a bit. The best, probably, no, is, uh, is when Bertie can tell that Jeeves is in a bad mood. <clears throat> doesn't know why. And he said, I wouldn't, he said, I wouldn't exactly say he was disgruntled, but he wasn't exactly gruntled either. <laughs> I think that packs quite a lot into a short line. Um... The imperishable scene, though, the, the summa, I think, of Woodhouse's work is in uh, The Code of the Worcesters. The great confrontation with Sir Roderick Spode, the, the fascist leader, and Shrink, um, and megalomaniac who Jeeves tells Bertie has set up a, a movement for the takeover of Britain for a law and order party. It was written in 1936, as well. And Jeeves says, and it's, uh, it's a Roderick's party and movement, sir, is called the, the Black Shorts. <laughs> and Bertie says, that's fine, Jeeves, I think I understand all that, but by the way, when you said Black Shorts, you meant shirts, didn't you? And I regret to say, sir, no. <laughs> um, by the time Sir Roderick formed his movement, the supply of shirts had been exhausted, and uh, his uh, followers paraded Black Shorts. And... Um, but he says, what do you mean they go around in, in footer bags, do they? And a Jew said, I'm sorry to inform you, sir, that this is the case. And Bertie says, how perfectly foul. Uh, the, the confrontation between him and Sir Roderick Spode is, I think, the... You can't do it in a line, but everyone, everyone, should, everyone should read that. That's the best. Yeah, there are a lot of things I know nothing about, and you can tell what they are, because I don't refer to them. <laughs> so, I'm not going to be caught out like that. I'd, I'd like to ask you uh, to comment upon two possibly provocative statements. Uh, the first is, do you, do you agree that the visceral anti-Americanism of the British left comes from their hatred of success? And the second, now that she's dead and about to become a saint, would you care to crack a joke about Mother Teresa? <laughs> <laughs> I was, um, I'll do this in reverse too, if I may, uh, because I can't wait. Um, I was asked by, I was asked by His Holiness the Pope, I was asked by the Vatican, I'm not, I am not making this up, I was asked to testify against her in the sainthood hearings. And I said, yes, I got a letter from the Vatican, I said, I'm, I'm coming, I'm going to be in Rome for as long as you like, and I'll stay for as long as it takes. And I was pretty sure Vanity Fair would spring for this. And they said, there were, I, there were two disappointments. One, they said, no, we'll have a special hearing for you at the Archdiocese at Catholic University in Washington, D.C., which I can see from my windows. So it was a taxi ride to go and meet this monsignor and this hedge priest and this deacon. Um, 
And the second disappointment was to discover, I didn't know this before, the office of devil's advocate. Everyone knows about the devil's advocate, right? Advocatus Diaboli, even non-Catholics know about it. The present pope has scrapped it. There is no longer a dialectical hearing on St. Jude. You don't get a prosecuting counsel appointed by the inferno, by, by Lucifer. <laughs> so they, instead it's more like a seminar on somebody's ghastly thesis where people can pen it. So I don't know if this is a joke or not, but it's in my observation that uh, I became the first person in the history of the Roman Catholic Church to represent the devil pro bono and for <laughs> I did it for nothing, and I told them why the old bitch shouldn't be canonized, and, I, and they, they, the other rule they've waived is this. There are two other rules they've waived. You're not supposed to start a sainthood hearing for seven years after the death so that popular and local superstition don't get command of the process, and you're supposed to have two miracles. And they opened the hearings after three years, so popular local superstition was still strong, and they found a miracle, which you will if you're looking for one. And it was some poor girl in Bengal who'd, who'd had a pain in her tummy, turned out to be a tumor, and had prayed to Mother Teresa for intercession, and the tumor had gone away. And I would say, I would submit this to you objectively, ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, fellow brothers and sisters in Christ. If that, if that doesn't prove it, I don't know what does. But the family of the woman and her physicians later testified, after being announced and certified as a miracle, that they knew why it had been cured and they had the operation and the records, medical records to prove it. So they're going to have to find another miracle now, but they will. They, I predict that they will. Anyway, it was, it was a pleasure to, to be of the devil's party, as, um, as uh, Blake said of Milton. Though what Blake said of Milton was he was of the devil's party without knowing it. I was at the devil's party voluntarily. The anti-Americanism of the British left, you really want your laughs, don't you? <laughs> you insist on a feast of reason and a flow of soul, a gag fest. Um, yeah, there's something pretty lugubrious about the British left, sure. There is. It's because they know they couldn't make it in America, I think. The sad sacks, jealous, and some of them increasingly, I think, anti-cosmopolitan, anti-internationalist provincial, <clears throat> dull, localized, resentful, <laughs> status quo, <laughs> boring. Um, on the subject of um, the American dream, have you ever been offered an endorsement deal by Rothmans or Johnny Walker? And if offered... <laughs> Would you take it? Man goes into a bar and says, uh, okay, I'll have a large glass of James Walker, please. The barman says, you mean Johnny Walker? He says, no, not when you know him the way I do. <laughs> well, I've, I've trailed my coat. I mean, I've, I've done my best, uh, but no. Something about me uh, apparently doesn't lead to to sponsorship, but I, 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 I've promised to keep on trying. I mean, I mean to, 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 to do my bit for it. Christopher, um, I just today I'm way back here. Um, I heard the story secondhand that you actually met Margaret Thatcher and that it was a very sexual experience. Can you do you remember that? <laughs> there are almost there are only two terms in the language that now give me an automatic. Um, Erection. <laughs> Which is still the polite word for it, isn't it? One of them is preemptive. <laughs> that seems to work practically every time. <laughs> Preventive used to work, but doesn't now. It takes preemptive to get the real sort of twanging hard on like now. <laughs> and the other is, oddly enough, and I'll, I'll, I promised I'd give you the truth, the word baroness. Um, I, I went to a party, this is when, this is, must have been in the very late 70s, she was only then the leader, newly elected leader of the Conservative Party. And I went to a ghastly party in the, the Roseberry Room of the House of Lords. 
for a terrible book by Lord Butler, formerly Rab Butler, on the history of the Conservative Party. It looked like a fantastically unpromising evening that I had to cover for the, the, the then New Statesman. Now I speak of the New Statesman, sadly, as an interred thing of the past. They're still publishing, I think, trading falsely under uh, the same name. And in this magazine, I had written a few weeks before at the Tory party conference that I thought that the power she had over the men in the Tory leadership was a sexual power, that she had an absolute radiance to her, that she knew exactly how many beans made five, and she'd sized up all of these men completely and bent them to her will. How right can you be, by the way? What happened to Francis Pym? Where is Willie Whitelaw now? Jim Pryor? You wouldn't give ninepence for the whole batch. She devoured them all. She was a gorgon. And now, my opinion, which may be immodest, is this. If in the late 1970s you were the newly elected leader of the Tory party and the columnist for the main socialist opposition weekly says that, that you're full of sex, it's possible you'll notice it or that someone will call it to your attention. At any rate, when we met and were introduced to this party, she seemed to know me. It's one of those things, it's so hard to define. <laughs> Think of the moment on the tram, the tram in Dr. Zhivago, where just as they brush, there's the crackle. I, I, I can still feel it, it's not that I felt it then. And we got into an argument about what was then Rhodesia and is now Zimbabwe. And she took what I thought was a reactionary position on it, and I told her that I'd ran, run into some Tories in, in my recent trip to Rhodesia who disagreed with her, and she disagreed with me on a point of fact and wouldn't let go. I was right. On the point of fact, I was correct. I insist on this. But she was so stubborn, she wouldn't give way. So finally I thought, okay, give the lady the point. And I said, well, you're probably right. And I inclined, as one does, with as much gallantry as I could muster to acknowledge it. Bow. Straightened up again. She said, um, bow lower. <laughs> um, Bertie Worcester says at one point of someone that he writhed like an electric fan. And of another person that uh, he withered like a salted snail. Um... It's difficult to describe which of these would most best describe my reaction, but I found I had no will. Yeah. I bowed low. And then I regained, I regained the vertical. And she said, no, no, much lower. <laughs> so as if I had been possessed, as if my corporeal form was occupied by an alien being, as if I lived only to obey. And by this time, people like Simon Hoggart and James Fenton were clustering around. What the fuck is this? <laughs> I have witnesses, in other words. I, I sort of bent like this. And all the while, behind her back, she'd been rolling up the House of Lords order paper of the day into a little tube. And as I did, she stepped smartly behind me and gave me a terrific thwack on what I can only describe as my bottom. I straightened up with immense difficulty. And to see her turn away and over her shoulder say, naughty boy. <laughs> Only preemption does that to me now. <laughs> and I have to, sometimes have to say it twice. Uh, she, the, the, the look she threw over her shoulder is with me still. And that was in 1978, uh, ladies and gentlemen, brothers in Christ, uh, comrades and friends. And nothing that she ever did after that, nor the people to whom she did it, ever surprised me. <laughs> nothing came as a surprise after that. H so it pays to have sex with the leader of the opposition. Is it on? Okay. You said you'd be honest, so tell me, what are you most frightened of? Boredom. Boredom terrifies me. I feel it like a physical sensation, like a choking dream, or like a smothering dream, as Wilfred Owen says in Dolce and Decorum Est, as if, if I go on talking to this person or being exposed to this set of circumstances for any longer, 
I really might die or go mad or bite someone. <laughs> At any moment, it's a, it leads to a fugue state. Uh, so arranging not to be bored is a fantastic, really large part of my life. Um, uh, fending off bores, finding out where they might be, where they, where they, <laughs> might, be, where they might be coming. And you, you know it's not paranoia because you know that there, are a lot, there really are a lot of them around and that they really do want to come and talk to you. And <laughs> tedium. Tedium is, tedium is the enemy because um, you'll be dead a very long time. I'm sure of that. And I've seen some dress rehearsals for it take place. And I, as I say, it's a, it's a losing struggle. There isn't a minute to be spent being bored. Anything is better than boredom. Uh, no terror could be worse than boredom. Um, against the bores, always against the bores. No, I, I, I am. It's a physical sphere as well as an emotional one. It's a dread. It's a nightmare. It's a poltergeist. It's a haunting. It never leaves me. I won't be bored. <laughs> and then there are the ones who aren't just boring, but they're the cause of boredom in others. The people who spread tedium like a fog. Um, it's full time. If, if, if that's all you did, you'd be busy all day. <laughs> Mustn't be boring. Don't be boring. Don't put up with a minute of it. Say, I'm really. I'm, some people think it's bad manners. You know, it is bad manners if you've met someone at a party and been introduced. You take your chances. You know, but, you, but you're not supposed to look over your shoulder, their shoulder, to see if there's someone more interesting. And it's true, you shouldn't. That's rude. But you can say, I'm, I'm sorry. You're just fantastically boring. <laughs> I don't have any time to give to this. <laughs> Nothing you could say would ever interest me. <laughs> don't bore somebody else. <laughs> I'm sorry, I just can't take it for another moment. I can't, I just can't take it. I won't okay. take it. I don't have to take it. I'm going now. Good evening. Good evening um, yourself. Do you see yourself in Peter Fallow in Wolf's um, Bonfire of the Vanities? No. Those who've read Peter, the Bonfire of the Vanities, you've read of this, will know that uh, Peter Fellow is an abject drunk, a sponge, a social toady, a climber, an incompetent journalist who writes about the houses of rich people and the gossip of New York City. So I know it's not me. Um, a, a lot of people thought that it might be me because He's in there for a reason. He's in there for a quarrel I had with Anthony Hayden Guest, um, which I could tell you all about if you liked. But, uh, do you want to hear about all about him? Okay. Um, Anthony Hayden Guest is a brilliant writer in many ways, but he, he is a bit of a Brit, a bit of a piss artist, a bit of a New York socialite. And when I had to write an attacking profile of Tom Wolfe once, which I really wanted to do, I asked Anthony to arrange a meeting between us, and then I did to Tom Wolfe what he does to everyone else. I eavesdropped his conversation, ran to the men's room every now and then to write it down, and wrote a piece showing how shabby his table talk was, exactly what he'd done to Leonard Bernstein and the others. And he was unbelievably uh, slow to see the joke. Um, <laughs> for such a white-coated, straw-hatted, Panama-boated, Wit, who's fucking slow, very slow to see the joke, and I, I'm sad to say, very quick to take it out on poor Anthony, who I hadn't told, I hadn't told Anthony that was my plan at all. Uh, Wolf thought poor Anthony had set it up, so it was a bad business, and he quarrelled with Anthony and cast him out of his circle, and then he put in the book a journalist, an English sponger, who's clearly, well, I'll just say, not me. Um, this uh, journalist also. Um, no, this would be dirty. This would, this would involve filth. Are you going to demand filth? <laughs> Barracking for filth. Okay. No one ever loses money betting on the lowest common denominator of his audience. Well, the story about Anthony Hayden Guest is always that he's, he's cursed. Lots of men worry about this. It isn't always discussed in public. Not everyone comes clean about it. But a lot of men worry that their penises are too large. <laughs> and that... <laughs> it's an impressive cackle there. <laughs> and um, where was that? Right under the lights I get this sort of 
eldritch mirth at the idea of a dick that's too big. <laughs> <laughs> well, they, what they worry about is there won't be enough blood for both of them. Or there may be some urgent need for a transfusion. And the, the myth about uh, Anthony was that this was true, and that's in the book too. Um, a terrible, a terrible, a really disgraceful, uh, unsuitable for family consumption episode where the naughty girls at the office during the Christmas party peel back the horrible lid of the Xerox machine and take the helplessly drunk man to the, and slap it on and Xerox them. How low can you go? Anyway, Anthony uh, became very cross with me because he said he blamed me for the whole thing and the misrepresentation of him in the book and he put his hands right around my neck like this on the steps of the New York Public Library after a Vogue dinner and said you've ruined my entire reputation in the town and you've held me up to mockery and in Wolf's book and it was quite an impressive pressure I had the, I had the time to say but Anthony all I really said about you is you've got a gigantic cock and his grip palpably relaxed around my throat <laughs> while he thought about that and I had time to break free <laughs> so it goes to show if you know how to find somebody's G-spot that's half the battle I can't believe I told you any of that but I promised you a truthful reply Um, I have I nothing think... to drink at the moment, Peter. Is there any remedy for this that you can devise? I mean, I've literally, I haven't even got any water. How could you tell? Was I running on empty? My view, my practice, my promise, uh, comrades, is that I, don't, I won't leave when anyone feels they have an unanswered question, but don't try me too high. What time is it, for one thing? Um, can you tell us a bit more about uh, Martin Amis? Are you still best friends? And in your heart of hearts, do you, who do you think is a smarter one? <laughs> um, Martin is uh, able to quote not just poetry but prose. Uh, I can do a certain amount of poetry and um, a sonnet sequence but Martin can quote paragraphs of prose from Dickens and Nabokov and show a real understanding of them. Um, it's an achievement I've very, very, very rarely seen uh, replicated. And in addition to that, he's the only blonde I've ever really, really loved. Good evening. Um, Good evening yourself. Can you tell us what you think the major reasons are for you not being a major politician or a major rock star? <laughs> Again, if I may do it in reverse order. <laughs> well, the rock star is obvious. I couldn't handle any more action than I'm getting as it is. <laughs> it would be surplus to requirements. Okay? I just don't need the aggravation of being a rock star. I used to want very much to be, I used to want very much to represent a, a, a constituency in Parliament. I'd have at one point given anything to do it, but, um, uh, but I was expelled from the Labour Party uh, because of Vietnam, and I decided I was prouder of that than of anything I could have done uh, in the other direction. It's still, to me, a, a moment of, of, of pride that the Wilson Labour Party kicked out myself and the rest of the student uh, then student leadership of the Labour Party and um, we considered that resignation or expulsion to be final um, and still is I think the lowest point of, um, of the post-war Labour Party Other, others might nominate other low points but it won't go any lower than Harold, Harold Wilson licking Lyndon Johnson's bottom it won't uh, so that's why I had to give up that. And then I found, well, I wasn't fit for any other work but journalism. And now you see the harvest, as uh, Jeeves used to say. As Bertie used to say. Excuse me. Now view the harvest. My dear chap, thank you. I'm afraid of losing my voice and I need this particular medicine. <laughs> I'm going to rasp a bit. 
That was a very solemn question, by the way. You flirt with a solemn ending to the evening, if you go on like this. Good evening. Um, I'd Good evening like, again. I'd like to expand your views on the royal family. Do, do you think the fact that we still live in a monarchy says something about, about the British public? Or you know, does, it, does it say something about the attributes of the royal family? What about Princess Diana? Well, with Princess Diana... I'm trying to remember what you said about Princess Diana. Well, I... Compared her to a landmine. Well, there's a horrible joke about a landmine, yes. Yes. She was in Angola on her landmine campaign. And there was a hushed, reverent BBC commentator who said, the thing about minefields is that they're, they're very easy to lay but they're very difficult and dangerous and even expensive to get rid of. Now, the perfect description of, of, um, of uh, Prince Charles's first wife. You wrote it. And it was printed. Oh, uh, yeah. Uh, Thomas Paine, who was, I think, the greatest Englishman and the greatest American, and is the first man to use the expression, the United States of America, I think, I'm pretty sure, and is the moral author of the Declaration of Independence and the man who organized the ruin of the Hanoverian riffraff in um, North America, uh, said, uh, as well as having written The Age of Reason and the Rights of Man and showing that, that you can't have one without the other, that the two concepts are the same, The Age of Reason, The Rights of Man. You invents human rights. I know where you live, too. <laughs> Don't do that. Um, he said that a hereditary uh, government is as, as good as a hereditary poet or hereditary mathematician. Um, actually, it's not as good, because I think some mathematical talent can be inherited. I don't think much poetic talent can be. But it's, it's as absurd as that. So people who want to be governed by it are servile. My quarrel with monarchism is obviously for its absurdity for, and stupidity, the idea that, that, the, that it's designed by the blood. Breeding a ruling family and selecting it is as, is as nasty in its implications as breeding a master race. Eugenics won't do for politics. You can't do it. They say, well, uh, uh, of the wretched Spencer girl, they said, well, at least she had an heir and a spare before she was cut down. Well, how nasty is that? It's like reading about some ghastly animal experiment. No, people who want to be ruled in this way, the quarrel, therefore, is with monarchical opinion. These people are servile. They want to be impressed in this way. That's the kind of thing they like. The quarrel is with public opinion. Um, I mean, if, what's, more, what's more horrible, to see some, some mediocre imposter ride by in a golden coach or to see people you know, flinging themselves onto the pavement to get a glimpse of it and, and tell all their children about it and say, you know, you won't believe the excitement I had today. The human race is damned when people are willing to worship. The, the willingness to worship is, the, is, is our problem. It's like North Korea. You get every chance to praise the leader all the time and thank him for your, for your benizens and for being the fount of all good things. You're a serf if you think like that. So the real thing is to cure British people of servility. Otherwise, you could take the monarchy away and they bring it back. I have to leave you with this, because you have been a really great audience, I don't uh, Even though you will laugh at anything. Um, <laughs> this is the longest joke I know, and I'll, I'm giving it to you. It's a kind of a free gift. Anyone who remembers this joke will know how to tell it at any length from now on. You can build in new wings to it and new extensions to it, uh, if you want. Um, I'll give you the condensed version. Picture, if you will. Um, the romance that kindles between a young man and a young woman. Her eye is first caught by his extraordinary courtesy. He will always take her coat. He will always open the door. He is always unfailingly polite. He's a man of extraordinary consideration. He finally talks her into the sack. Um, <laughs> you can build in the extensions later if you want. So extraordinary is the convulsion of pleasure to which he brings her. And the attention that he pays in order to bring this off, if you will, that she lies 
hardly daring to speak and says, I've, I never knew that it could be this way with a man and a woman. I just wish, I just wish there was something I could do to please you as you've pleased me. And he says, well, as a matter of fact, <laughs> there is something you could do if you kept it. And she said, well, just name it. And he said, so look, I kind of wish you'd give me a blowjob. And she says, no, no, I wish you'd said anything but that. Something tells me that if I do that, it won't be the same between us. You won't respect me. You won't admire me, esteem me, revere me in the same way. You won't defer to me. And so he, he's a gentleman. He takes it very well. This is the first day. It goes on like that. <laughs> it goes on like that for something like, for a year or so, and it's always the same. And you can, you can do your... And, Every time she says, I can't tell you, and if only, and he says, well, actually, since you mention it, and uh, no, but she says, you won't, you just, I know it won't be the same, you won't respect. They get married, the honeymoon night is a torrential tribute by him to her. <laughs> of every conceivable attention. Um, and, but in the meantime, always the door held open, always the taxi door held open, always the coat taken, always the deference, the tenderness. But even on honeymoon night, she won't. She just won't, because respect is a big thing. Uh, the 10th anniversary comes. <laughs> See how I'm leaving you the, 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 the room now. The, the silver wedding. I think we're talking about the pearl anniversary. He takes her to Cancun or Cayman Islands. I don't know, somewhere beautiful. The finest suite, the limo, the thoughtful, well-chosen gifts, the door held open. The attention, the courtesy, and the um, unfailing uh, uh, pleasuring. And finally, she lies back and she, th and she says, again, in a, in a dream of bliss, you've given me all these decades of love and care and tenderness and sex. And I just wish that only I could requite this in some way. And he says, well, you know what? I know I've mentioned this before, but... <laughs> If you could just see your way to... And she thinks, really, you know, why not? What can it hurt? Um, so, in what is still an almost maidenly manner, she falls to, she does her best, and it's pretty good. <laughs> and then it's over and she thinks, no, oh, that was wonderful, I, I should have learned to please him like this before. Um, and I should never have worried about his attentions, his courtesy, his deference. And they're lying there unable to speak in this, this dream of mutual assurance and the phone rings. And it rings and rings and rings and keeps on ringing in their suite and he says, aren't you going to get the phone, cocksucker? <laughs> <clears throat> well, it's been real and, and you've been very patient and I salute you. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen.